I recently noticed a lot of headlines about how the carbon footprint of homegrown food is five or six times that of crops grown on conventional farms. Now, I've been gardening and growing much of my own produce for some time now, and something just didn't seem quite right about these claims. All of the articles reference the same University of Michigan-led study that was published on Nature.com. So, I decided I'd like to hear the whole story straight from the horse's mouth and downloaded the entire study, its methodology, and its over 65,000 data points to see what's what. What I uncovered was shocking. The study is titled, Comparing the Carbon Footprint of Urban and Conventional Agriculture. Conventional agriculture is produce grown on conventional farms. Urban agriculture, or UA, is produce grown in and around cities. Now, this study includes 73 UA sites in Europe and the United States, seven urban farms which are professionally managed and focus on food production, nine collective gardens which are communal spaces managed by groups of gardeners, and 55 individual gardens which are just plain small plats managed by a single gardener. Now, what do they mean by the carbon footprint? For this study, that's the greenhouse gases, or GHG, per serving of fruit or vegetable, and that's calculated using the LCA. The result of the study is low-tech UA carbon footprint is six times that of conventional agriculture. But what is this LCA? According to the Carbon Leadership Forum, it's a life cycle assessment. It tracks the greenhouse gas emissions, GHG, through the life cycle of any product, cradle to grave. The stages of a typical life cycle, as defined in LCA, are the production and construction stages, the use stage, the end of life state, and externalized impacts beyond the system boundary. The study finds the total LCA of all the individual components used in UA, and these usually fall under one of three categories, infrastructure, supplies, or irrigation. The study also states that, quote, infrastructure is the largest driver of carbon emissions at low-tech UA sites, 63% of impacts. This includes raised beds, compost infrastructure, and structures, for example, sheds. Then it references supplementary table four. From this, I was able to pull out a top 10 list of the components with the highest LCA. Let's take a look at them as their percent of the total LCA score for UA. Number 10, storage shed or box, 1.34%. Number 9, fence, 1.37%. Number 8, greenhouses, 2.13%. Number 7, pavement, 2.70%. Number six, water use, 2.79%. Number five, synthetic fertilizer, 3.78%. Number four, compost bins, 4.02%. Number three, raised beds at 6.94%. You're going to love the top two. Number two is homemade compost making up 29.72% of the total LCA score for all UA. Now, I'd have to question including that at all in this study. Yes, you may well be composting in your home garden, and yes, the composting process will be producing greenhouse gases, but I submit that anything I might be composting would be at least generating as much greenhouse gas, probably more if it ended up in a landfill rather than my compost bin. You won't believe number one. Number one is garden house at 33.05% of the total LCA for all urban agriculture. Now, when I first saw this, I figured they must mean a greenhouse. Nope, there are already separate categories for greenhouse, gazebo, storage shed, deck, and pergola. They're literally including the house that the individual garden lives in, their house. But surely they can't be using that whole LCA thing to measure the greenhouse gases of the gardener's house, can they? Well, as luck would have it, our old friends at the Carbon Leadership Forum just happen to have a whole section describing how to calculate the LCA of a house over their four stages of its life cycle. Now, rather than summarize what they say, even though it's a little wordy, you want to see the exact words they use to describe each of these processes. The production stage involves the energy and resources used to extract raw materials, to transport the materials to product manufacturing facilities, and to produce the final building products. The construction stage involves the transportation of materials to the construction site, as well as the energy used to power the construction equipment to supply supporting construction 
construction materials and to dispose of any waste generated during the construction process. The use stage involves the impacts of occupying a building over its lifetime due to lighting, heating, water use, and any materials used for maintenance, repairs, and replacement. The end of life stage involves the demolition and disposal of the building as well as waste processing if the building is not repurposed or improved for further occupancy or use. Finally, the last stage gathers all of the miscellaneous effects of reusing, recycling, and or recovering materials, energy, or water from the project. So if I understand this correctly, when the study calculates how much greenhouse gas all of the garden components used to grow my two dozen tomatoes and bunch of carrots add up to, they're not just factoring in my raised beds and fertilizer, but also all of the greenhouse gases produced in manufacturing every material used in building my house, all of the greenhouse gases produced in transporting and then using these materials to actually build my house, all of the greenhouse gases produced when I turn on my lights, heat or cool my house, or wash the dishes, over its 100 year estimated lifespan by the way, and then to add insult to injury, they throw in how much greenhouse gas is produced when they eventually bulldoze my poor old house and haul it away to the dump. How generous. But why would anyone run a study in this manner? Was it just poor decision making? Or was something more nefarious in play? Well, I don't know the answer, but these two quotes from the study may give us a clue. As interest in UA increases, policymakers, citizens, and scientists must ensure that UA is beneficial for people and the planet. UA is expected to continue proliferating globally. Our findings suggest that steps must be taken to ensure that UA supports and does not undermine urban decarbonization efforts. As for me, I feel reasonably confident that my garden will not bring about the end of the world. Oh, and by the way, if the way they frame your garden bothers you, just wait till you see what they have to say about your pets and their carbon paw prints.